Good afternoon, members of the media, and by extension, members of the wider community. Today, Cabinet has approved the draft education policy paper, which will take us up to 2022. Cabinet also agreed that the document must be subject to public consultation, which must be completed by October the 31st. The genesis of this document is the National Consultation on Education that was held in November 2016. In formulating this document, we examined a number of papers that will be for us. For example, the National Development Strategy, Vision 2030, reports prepared by various consultants on education-specific topics such as testing and assessment, including benchmarking of selected policy areas, conclusions from meetings with various education stakeholders and internal clients, including senior technical staff and heads of divisions units of the Ministry of Education, <coughs> for example. And then we looked at what happens at the regional level, for example, CARICOM Regional Education and Human Resource De Development Plan 2030, the Strategy and Action Plan, and at the international level, we looked at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2013. The plan identifies three specific objectives. Effective governance and administration, access to educational opportunities, and the provision of quality education. <coughs> the document focuses in detail on the following levels of education. Early childhood care and education, primary education, <coughs> secondary education, technical vocational education and training, tertiary education. These are some of the areas that we focus on. And as I said before, this plan will be subject to national, a national consultation where we will be inviting the views of the wider public. And after that has been received, we will make whatever adjustments that are needed to be made to this document, and then it will be relayed to Parliament. That's one. The second item that we would like to discuss with you this afternoon is the secondary education assessment. First of all, I'd like to state publicly that the results of this examination will be delivered to all schools on Wednesday, the 4th of July, 2018. Parents will be able to receive these results from the schools that their students attend. And therefore, principals will be asked, first of all, to collect these schools at the various education offices from, from 8 a.m. on Wednesday next week. This year, 19,139 students wrote the exam, of which 9,694 were male students, and 9,445 were female students. As we all know, the essay comprised three subjects, English, language, arts, writing, which is commonly referred to as creative writing, mathematics, English, language, arts. I think it is important for me to state that this year, the student who placed first in this exam, in other words, the student who scored the highest, was a male student. For some time, we have been noticing that our girls have been outperforming the boys where first place is concerned. But this year, a boy has been placed first, and girls have occupied the second and the third places. <coughs> we
we did an analysis of the results. And of course, you know, over time, we have been having some concerns about students who have scored below 30%. This year, as we did last year, students who scored below 30%, depending on their age and whether they have written the exam before, those students who are under the age of 13 will be asked to repeat the exam in their respective schools. Students who are 13 years and above will be allowed to move on to secondary schools. This was instituted last year, and I must say with considerable success. I have had a number of parents approaching me and thanking the Ministry of Education for this initiative. In one case, a parent came to me and told me that his daughter was appointed as the, school, the class valedictorian at the recent graduation exercises. And the fact that children are allowed to repeat would give them an opportunity to develop. But because we have a problem with age, those students who are above the age of 13 will go on to the secondary schools, where also we have been placing the majority of those students in particular schools with a special curriculum. And again, the feedback that we have been receiving from both principals, teachers, and parents is that initiative is bearing fruit. So more statistic, statistical information. 65.5% of students who wrote the exam scored above 50%. In the area of mathematics, 58.8% of the students scored above 50%. In the area of English language, 57.9% of the students scored above 50%. And in creative writing, 55.5% of the students scored above 5%, above 50%. It is our intention to do everything possible so that these percentage points will be increased. And uh, at the Ministry of Education, we have instituted a number of initiatives, starting from Infant 1 right on to Standard 5, that will assist our students so that in the not too distant future, we are going to see a marked improvement in the performance of these students. Let me reiterate the results will be issued next Wednesday. Principals will be asked to, to contact and collect these results at the various education offices, and the parents will be able to access these results through the schools at, approxi at approximately 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Thank you very much. I asked Minister Garcia if that is on Wednesday because I am one of those anxious parents that we lining up from 9 a.m. next week, Wednesday, to get results. Well, you'll have to wait until Wednesday for the results. Well, that's what I just said, Minister Garcia. <laughs> I said I'll be anxiously awaiting until next Wednesday. Um, members of the media, you've heard those two very critical and important announcements from the Ministry of Education under the leadership of Minister Garcia as the Minister of Education. At this stage, I'll open up the floor, as usual, to take questions on either what he's asked, or I see the hand shooting up already, what he's informed us of, or what it is you'd like to ask. On the SU results, um, SU, um, is there any, do you have the comparative statistics last in terms of performances? Yes. Have the students improved or not compared to last time? I just want I can make it available to you. Okay, especially what are you looking at? Tell me. If you if you're looking at the overall performance in the particular subject areas, that is what you're looking at. Okay, in 2017, in the area of mathematics, those students who scored above 50 percent was exactly 58.0 percent. This year it was 58.8%, a slight increase. In the area of 
language arts, last year, 63.8% of students scored above 50%. This year, there was a slight decrease in 57.9%. And the, in the area of language arts, writing, and creative writing, last year was 54.4%. This year was 55.5%. So in two of the areas, we had slight increases. And in one area, we had a slight drop. Clint? I just wanted to ask, uh, Minister, given what you said earlier, um, are you in a position at this point in time to tell it, to give it to the others the name of the boy who talked to SEA or even the school, perhaps? No, I am not in a position to say that. In fact, if the truth be told, I myself do not know the name of the student nor the name of the school. Some kids even who are <laughs> that, that is the normal course. You know, we can't announce anything before all of the results are released. I will receive released. the official results on Tuesday at approximately 5 p.m., which I have to sign off on the results. To clarify, can you give a comparison of boys versus girls, though? Uh, has there been any sort of improvement in boys. either gender? Boy, did boys improve? Did the boys improve? won this year. I don't have that comparison. What the comparison I have is, in, is in accordance with the subject areas. But I can tell you, just from discussions and from the fact that a boy was able to top the exams, it seems as though our male students have improved. Any update on uh, the Guardian newspaper report that there's an impasse between the Ministry and the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Private Secondary Schools? Let me begin by saying that there is no impasse. I don't know how or where the Guardian got the information that there is an impasse. The private schools principals are asking for an increase in the stipend that is paid to them on the basis of the, their intake of each child. What happens at, at present? is that the Ministry of Education pays to the private schools $1,200 per term per child. And they're asking for an increase. They're asking for an increase from $1,200 to $5,700 per child. We met with a delegation, and uh, we discussed the matter, and uh, we decided that a committee should be formed comprising the senior officers of the Ministry of Education to meet with the principals, the private schools principals of the secondary schools. There was one meeting of that committee, and uh, the principals were asked to supply us with some additional information. We got some information, but not all the information that we required. However, we have come up with a position which we will make known to them. And on the basis of continued discussions, then hopefully we'll come up with a recommendation which we'll have to take to cabinet for cabinet's approval. And that is the situation as it stands. There is no impasse, there is no fight. We have been saying all along that we appreciate the fact that the principals of these primary schools, in fact, the, the private schools have been playing a very important role in education. In fact, they have been allowing us to ensure that there is access of our children to secondary schooling, and we will want to keep this also. And again, it is in, in consultation with our private partners because this government is very much aware of the fact that private-public partnerships would be the way to go if we want to achieve the level of successes in our various areas. So we have no fight with the principals of the private schools. We are determined to work with them to see how best we can resolve this. I, again, I can say that we at the Ministry of Education accept the fact that since, 20, since 2005, that was the last time they received a, a, an increase from $1,000 to $1,200, and we accept the fact that there's need for some increase. The quantum of the increase will be subject to discussions. All those schools <coughs> When you say the in terms of the payment, in other words, whatever the, the, the fee that is paid now, I'm saying, is there any uh, debt by the ministry towards these? Well, that is a totally different issue. 
what has happened is that there has been some level of outstanding payments. Only six of the schools have submitted invoices for payments for term three. And we are asking that the other schools that have outstanding invoices, please submit those invoices so that we can make the payments as quickly as possible. Do you have a figure in terms of these invoices that were submitted so far? Well, the invoices will, will, det will be determined by the size of the school. Remember, the principals are paid in accordance with the, the size of the school. Each child is being, or for each child, the sum of $1,200 will be paid for a term. So depending on the size of the school. So at this point, I cannot say the exact quantum of the invoices. It will vary from school to school. So I have a question on this issue. Um, in terms of replacement of pupils, is that also something that is an issue, or there's no issue there? There's no issue there. I want to inform the general public that all students will be placed. Now, you remember I said earlier on that students who are under the age of 13, but who scored less than 30% will be asked to repeat. But as long as those students who are over 13 and who have, and who have performed creditably, they will also be sent to a secondary school. We have no issue with school placing. All our students will be placed. Can you just clarify how many students, if you can, how many students scored below 30%? Eleven point nine percent of the overall students scored below thirty percent, and that amounted to two thousand five hundred and ninety-five students of the nineteen thousand students who wrote. And you have the number over thirteen, the ones who aren't allowed to resit resit the exam. And is there any sort of special arrangement to help them along? Because clearly they did not pass. Those students school. who will be asked to repeat the primary schools at standard five, we have put things in place to ensure that they will benefit from what has to be offered. And some of the things that we have put in place is effective supervision. That is one, in other words, we have asked our school supervisors to visit the schools on a more regular basis. In addition to that, our curriculum officers have been visiting the schools and, and they have been meeting with the teachers and they have been offering the teachers guidance in the implementation of the curriculum. <coughs> At the secondary level, where the students who are over 13 years of age are placed, we have adapted the curriculum. In other words, the emphasis now is to ensure that those students can learn to read, they can learn to write properly, and they will be pro proficient in numeracy and literacy. Those are the areas of focus in addition to extracurricular activities and uh, the VAPA, the performing arts. We are giving them the opportunity to excel in these areas. So can you say how many schools will be repaired during the July August period? Again, I have made this known publicly. 160 schools have been selected for repairs during the July-August vacation period. Do you have a budget for that, Minister? Yes, a budget has been approved by Cabinet. Yes. What is you on the private schools? They are asking for an increase from 1,200 to 5,700, which seems like a, a fair, fairly substantial increase. Has the Ministry considered um, how much of that it may be willing to consider? As I said before, a committee is meeting with the principals of the private secondary schools, and I cannot at this point disclose what is the ministry's position. That will be contrary to good industrial relations practices. Well, I'm hoping that that could be resolved before the end of July. Any other questions? Yeah, on the issue of the Princess Town 1 Presbyterian schools, and Princess Town 1 and 2 Presbyterian schools, Mr. Garcia, um, they've literally been in the news sometimes more than one day per week protesting for the construction of a new school there. Um, what is the ministry's position on this? Have you seen their actions? Have you seen their cause? And 
what is the position going forward? The ministry's position is quite clear. Those schools are owned by the Presbyterian Board. And before we can do anything, we must get the concurrence of the Presbyterian Board. We have been meeting with the Presbyterian Board, and they have outlined certain areas where we can have an improvement to the school. And we are hoping that in the not too distant future, we'll be able to outline a plan that will bring an end to the shift system in the school and be of satisfaction to all of those persons, parents, students, members of the board. Future. Can you give a little more specifics because it's been going on for about four years now and students are getting and that is why school, right? I am clear in saying in the not too distant future. I don't want to say next week or next month. I cannot predict the exact date. All I can say is that we are working so that it, in the shortest possible time we can bring a resolution to this matter. The level of discussions with the board of the Presbyterian? Um, yes, we have always had cordial discussions. I'm, I'm very satisfied with the discussions that are ongoing. So the question would be then why, why is it still taking this long for a resolution um, to be reached? The basic reason is the lack of funding. As you know, we have 107 schools that have been left without completion when we entered office. And it is proving to us to be a mammoth task. Many of our contractors have not been paid and we are doing everything possible to put things in place so that our contractors will be paid and the construction of these schools will be resumed. The important thing where the Presbyterian number one and two, those two schools are concerned, is that we have provided access for all those children so that in spite of the fact that they have to operate on a shift system, they have access to an education which is their right. Thank you. I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Young. Uh, you could have heard talks again just very recently, um, could have been yesterday with the Venezuelan officials concerning the drug and the cross border issue. Um, how soon can you really expect the delivery of that gas? Is, is, do you have a more defined timeline now? What I can say is in yesterday's discussions, we've narrowed, these are very complex things, especially to bring gas from another, another sovereign state into our state. It's never been done before, certainly in this side of the world. We have finally narrowed down all of the terms and conditions, and we're outstanding on one item. Yesterday, I think we brought it a bit closer to closure what the Minister Covedo, who is the Minister of Energy, Petroleum, President of Pedavesa in Venezuela, told his team and I told our team and Shell told their team, sit down and work at it hard over the next couple of weeks. I'm supposed to return to Caracas on Monday the 16th of July, and hopefully then we'll be able to bring it to closure. Um, once that is done, we're looking at an estimate of between 18 months to two years to build the infrastructure and get first gas here. We are pressing as hard as we can. As you know, Venezuela has a number of challenges. So despite those challenges, the conversations and talks continue to progress. And what I can say is we've now narrowed it down to one item. And in these types of discussions, that's quite an accomplishment. Who will build the infrastructure? Just a follow-up. Um, excuse me, let me go one second. Um, who will build the infrastructure and who will pay for it? We have set up a uh, SPV between NGC and Shell. So it is envisaged that that SPV special purpose vehicle will be the one that builds the infrastructure to get it. Why this is so attractive is the Dragon Field is only 18 kilometers off of a hibiscus platform, which is partially owned by the government, by Shell, and then the NCMA pipeline coming down. So that is the SPV that will build this infrastructure and upgrade it. Can you tell us what that one sticking point is? Price. Maybe the was Price. Right. Yeah. What, 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 what I'll leave it at that at this stage. We're negotiating on the issue of price at this stage, but we've narrowed a lot down. Things like governing law principles, things like how the infrastructure would work, where we do the measurements. A lot of, a lot of work has been going into it. Right now we're just stuck at price. How soon do you hope to have a final agreement? I'm hoping by the 16th. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. You released 
Day also said that you invited Mr. Quevedo to Trinidad. Did he accept and when will he be We're working on that. So as soon as we, we finalize that, we'll make the announcement. Can you just remind me, how much gas is the deal, how much gas per day? What, what, what <coughs> should we get it? Right now, we're looking at the first tranche, the first part of the deal being 150 million scuffs. And, and the conversations the government is having with Venezuela, <coughs> does Lauren Manati form any part of those conversations? We have specifically, and, and, and what I lead is specifically stuck to Dragon alone. I mean, I just want us to focus on Dragon. I can tell you that we are also progressing the Lauren Manati conversation. And right now, it's before the Venezuelan government, uh, unitization part of the agreement. There's stages and processes that you take these things through. And right now, on the Trinidad side, we've approved the unitization plan. And I think we're waiting on the Venezuelans to approve it on their side. Any concerns? Because as you spoke about the challenges in Venezuela, uh, but if for any reason uh, there's any change in the political climate in Venezuela, any concern about the deal being honored here? Not at this stage. I mean, what you would have observed, despite all of the noise taking place in our parliament and in our system, by those on the other side and the opposition continuing to try and carry that conversation, you have not heard that noise from the opposition in Venezuela. At the end of the day, the Trinidadian government and Trinidadian companies are trying to strike a deal that is obviously beneficial to both sides. And whatever we do, we'll be able to stand up in whatever light and with the greatest amount of transparency and accountability. So right now, that does not pose a concern for us on this side. Is it possible? So is the plan to increase from 150? Yes. Yeah, because that's not a lot. No. If we could get that today in, into our point, Lisa's plans, I mean, it is a lot. But that's the startup. Understand this is a field that they've done exploration. They've, they've not produced any gas but they have some wells that have gas in it so we want to start and i think as I, I keep saying i think once that gas starts to flow the whole dynamic is going to change was the minister of energy part of those discussions yes which minister of energy our minister of energy no so another matter um little announcement that uh cnmg uh, a board has been appointed a new board but then we also got the announcement that the ttt uh, is to be set up very soon. So is this board a transitionary board? No, let me, I'm glad you provided me that opportunity as I saw C News in the back. It's going to be very, very exciting. I'm glad for this, this mandate and to lead this transition. CNMG is going to be rebranded TTT. So the previous decision taken or any previous talk about shutting down CNMG, that's not going to happen. We're going to go, we're going to rebrand TTT. In fact, this morning, the Prime Minister asked me at Cabinet how soon I expect to do it. There was an announcement. I, I wasn't in Parliament a couple of weeks ago when it was announced August. I'm hoping to bring that forward to July. I've chosen a logo. We're going to launch. It's going to be very exciting. I've already begun discussions. I'm going to be meeting with the board in the next couple of days. We'll present them with their letters of appointment. They're not a transitionary board. They're the board that I expect to lead the charge and to rebrand CNMG into TTT, but in that rebranding process, it's going to be a lot of fresh and new programming. Um, we're going to change the whole way they broadcast now. There's going to be a radio station, or maybe two radio stations involved in this whole process. And I'm hoping it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, we have a lot of good plans, and what we're really hoping is the whole positive nature of news and information, documentaries, and a lot of good things going on in Trinidad and Tobago will be able to be broadcast from TTT. And I'm also going to be meeting with the staff, hopefully next week, as well as all of the various bodies, CNMG, Information Division, etc., that now fall under me, to tell them about the plans. And I'm sure they will then go very happily and announce what it is we're going to be doing and what they are going to be an essential part of. One thing comes to mind, which is, of course, the issue of jobs, of contracts uh, at CNMG and so on. Uh, what assurances will you be giving staff there in terms of those two things? I have asked for all of the information. The information is coming to me. They're still in the process of setting up a separate Ministry of Communication. I never give assurances. But what I can tell you is, I think right now, from what they've told me, the initial numbers, etc., there are actually vacancies to be filled. And 
hopefully I'll provide the leadership to take TTT, the new TTT, in a direction that makes it the leader. So TV6 and CNC3, watch out. I, I don't have those figures in front of me. The information is still coming. Um, you want a job? Um, because there, are, there is concern in the uh, private media entities about um, unfair competition. Um, this new entity um, being backed by the state, um, it going into local programming. Um, some of the private companies have already started going into local programming, and there's the concern that there will be an unfair advantage. Um, Absolutely not. How could it be? This, this is a, an organization that has, was actually the only organization that existed at one point in time. Private sector have come in, private sector televisions have come in, television stations have come in, etc. Never be afraid of competition. And this government will not engage in any unfair practices, etc. Uh, will the issue of the news product from TVT uh, be of the same order as it obtains now with CNMG? Stay tuned. <laughs> any other questions? And so you raised something interest, an interesting point in um, your conversation about the dragon field and when and the date that you will be going back, but that particular date is also a very different date. It has a significance in another dimension. So in that context, what is the government's position with respect to the continuing concerns about acquisition of the Galleons Passage, all of the various elements, whether a broker was used, whether a broker was not used. And, um, no, the date that I've announced is actually the date. I thought you were referring to the by-elections. Right? That's what you don't... Well, hold on. Let me, let me just understand what you're asking me. I said I'd go across there on the 16th of July, of course, when I agreed... Mm -hmm. ...is the day when the Galleons Passage is tentatively... I'm not going to go on the Galleons I Passage. Mean, the boat is supposed to come here. So I think they were counting on me to moor the boat either. No, I I actually thought you were asking about the by election, which is also supposed to be on the sixteenth which, which is for the sixteenth of July. I I play no part right now or have any role to play in the arrival of the Galleons passage or the mooring of it, etc. I am hoping that the vessel like the rest of Trinidad I'm hoping the vessel arrives on that day, if that's the day that they've given. I haven't heard the specific day. And look forward to the arrival of the vessel. That will play absolutely no role or part in what I'm doing on that day. The concerns, the questions continue to be raised about the way that the vessel was purchased. Yeah, I and specifically, and the, and the, and the understood. thing coming up is whether a broker was used or not. I, I understand your question, or I just didn't understand the correlation. That was actually discussed at Cabinet today. We've just come out of a Senate session, I think sometime earlier this week, where my understanding is the issues raised and, and the narrative being raised by the opposition have fallen flat. What will happen is very shortly the Minister of Finance will lay in Parliament the documentation involved in the procurement of the Galleons Passage. I can tell you there was nothing abnormal in the procurement. As, uh, Small cabinet subcommittee of which I was a part were given the mandate to find a vessel. We were in a, an emergency situation. A vessel was found. It was a good deal for Trinidad and Tobago. But when it came to the procurement of the vessel, who contracted for the vessel, as you know, that's NITCO. NITCO is the one now that is in charge of dealing with the vessel, etc. With respect to this issue being raised as, with rebrokerage and these types of things, very shortly the Minister of Finance will lay the appropriate documents in Parliament for everyone to see. And I don't think there's any issue there whatsoever. But when that, when, that day does, when that does eventually happen, is it the government's position that when that does happen, that the position that has been advanced, that there was no broker, will be made clear or that I, The documentation will make all of the issues clear because the documentation will lay out exactly what it is that happened. I am not 100% familiar with what has been raised. I saw it early this morning, an issue being raised about brokerage, etc. Let's wait for the Minister of Finance to lay the documents and see where it goes. How long would that happen? Because, I mean, we are going to, we're reaching the, almost the end of the current session. And He's been asked to do it. Session. He's been asked to do it before that, the end of the session. Tomorrow. Let's see when he does it. Uh, yeah. no. Just final, um, just well, for me. <laughs> 
Smith report, do you have any update on that? Um, will it be released to the public? Will it, have you all reviewed it? What's the latest on that? The Smith report was presented to the Prime Minister on the 4th of June. When one reads the Smith report, it is a report that then, when the Prime Minister received advice, should then go to persons who are named in the report. So that is the process that is taking place right now. I am not certain whether that has been done or not, but it is premature at this stage for the Smith report to be released because certain persons named in it should be given the opportunity to look at it and to respond to it and then see where it goes. What, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs report? The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, well, the report on what happened at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that was done by Ambassador Christopher Thomas is supposed to be laid in Parliament via the Foreign Affairs, um, the Joint Select Foreign Affairs Committee. So it'll be sent to that committee for them then to take a look at it and see what they do with it. Again, I'm not sure about that. It should have been done. There's nothing preventing it from being laid, so I'm not sure where it is. Could I, could I ask Just one second. The U.S. State Department's Director of Countering Violent Extremism was in Trinidad for a couple of days this week. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just in, less than two weeks after the issue of the number of foreign terrorist fighters in Trinidad was the subject of the hearing for the next U.S. ambassador to this country held in Washington, has the U.S. government directly communicated to the government of Trinidad any concern about this particular issue? All right, I'm glad you raised that. I have actually met with this gentleman previously. I've met with him both in Trinidad and in Washington. What was relayed to me yesterday, actually, while I was in Caracas, is that his comments with respect to Trinidad and Tobago, he seemed to have missed something, but I didn't hear his specific comments. So it was in the form of a, not an apology, but look, don't be concerned because it didn't re refer specifically to Trinidad and Tobago. But as I say, I'm not quite certain what it is he, can, he has said. What I can tell you is the Trinidad and Tobago government continues to work very closely with the US government. So we're in constant conversation about a number of areas related to this, this topic. For example, tomorrow we, we return to parliament for the debate on the anti-terrorism report coming out of the Joint Select Committee and the anti-terrorism bill, a report that was signed by everyone who was part of that Joint Select Committee. So these are discussions that take place. We're in constant discussion with respect to the sharing of intelligence. I think what he was here for and what the area he leads is CV, which is countering violent extremism. So we're always exchanging ideas with them. We exchange ideas with Australia, with the Canadians, with, with the British, etc. At this stage, there is nothing that is, of course, of concern to the US State Department with respect to Trinidad and Tobago. They haven't said, look, this is an area we're concerned about that we need you to look at, and we continue to exchange information across a number of different areas. Sorry, this is a follow up. One of the things he did tell us in the interview we did with him was the issue of the, the nexus between, let's say, when you have uh, violent crime, criminal gang activity, and attempts to recruit persons into terrorism. We do have a situation with uh, not just the homicide rate, but criminal gang activity. Um, so he did say, well, there is, on a global sense, there is a connection. And is that something that is of concern to the government? It's always been of concern to the government. For, in fact, that has formed the basis of some of my conversations, along with Minister Dillon, with both the US, with England, with all of our partners. There is, in every single country where you see this happening, there are similarities between those who join criminal gangs and those who sometimes find themselves in extremism. Um, terrorist extremism. There are some who, who, who go into it for different reasons, but there are similarities, right? You find people who are looking for something to hold on to. They want to be part of a group. They're looking for a life where you get kudos for carrying around firearms, blah, 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 and these types of things. So there is, there is a link between these types of activities and the criminal gang activity that we see, etc. In Trinidad and Tobago, as you heard Minister Dillon say here a few weeks ago, you now have two umbrellas of gangs in Trinidad and Tobago. You have those who are saying they're Rasta City, you have those who are saying they're Muslims. Those who say they're Muslims, are they really practitioners of Islam and following the, the, the teachings of the Quran, etc.? That's questionable. So if that is what he said and what he told you, it is something that we share.
That's a similar concern, Clint. Wanted to bring amendments to the to the legislation. Uh, did the attorney general indicate to the ad cabinet whether he is in receipt of those th those types of uh, amendments? We all? did have some discussion of it at cabinet today. I, my recollection is the attorney general said at this point in time he has not as yet received the amendments, but I think they'll talk about that shortly. And um, in fact, what he had done is he had looked at the Hansard to try and extract what he thought the proposed amendments were. But at this stage, up to when we were in cabinet a short while ago, the Attorney General had not received any formal amendments from the opposition. Where, where things are now, and where we, where, where we are going into tomorrow, are we in danger of the bill lapsing as we go to recess? No. So nothing will happen? To the, to Let's wait and see what happens tomorrow. That's what the, the bill is on for debate. The report, which includes the bill, is on for debate tomorrow. So there's no question of lapsing at this stage. Any other questions? You have a question for Minister Garcia. Yes, ma'am. Concerning the SEA, this last SEA that was sat here, um, the format has changed for 2019. Is the school teachers and stuff ready? In terms of the students that are now in standard four, are they prepared and ready for that new format in 2019? Let me state that the format has not been changed. The students will be tested in three areas that I identified. However, there have been some slight changes in terms of the questions that are to be asked of the students. It is not a change in the format. And I can tell you, those changes have been the, uh, the result of discussions that were held with the teachers themselves through a number of workshops. So it is just to bring them in line with what has been happening uh, on, in respect to our delivery of education at the primary level. So do you think that they, what, has, what the changes that were made, are you, do you think that the teachers are equipped already for that for the Yes, the teachers are equipped, the teachers are ready. All those teachers have attended a number of workshops and they are ready. The information that I have from the supervisors who meet with the, with the teachers who visit these schools is that they are ready, they have been trained in those areas. It isn't any large change or large amount of changes, just some minor changes. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much for your time this afternoon. Appreciate it.